Welcome to the Word Examine Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Wagner, intern pastor and true crime enthusiast. This season, we will dive into the ultimate true crime story, the life, ministry, and death of Jesus Christ. This is a story you may have heard before, but I hope that with this telling, you can place yourself in the story and consider what it would have been like to shout Hosanna at the triumphal entry, share a meal at the Last Supper, or bear witness to one of the most brutal forms of murder in our history. I'm glad you're on this journey with me. We've got quite the story to tell, so let's start at the beginning. In order to understand the last week of Jesus' life, we have to start at the very first. This episode will be a crash course to all things Jesus, from his birth and baptism to his miracles, teachings, and understanding the things he did that led people to want to kill him. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is this servant, Messiah, and radical savior that would change everything? Our story starts with the birth of a king who would make all things new, and radically shift ideas of who God is and what God has done for the world. You see, God is faithful to God's people. Prophecies had been made throughout all of time pointing to a Messiah and Savior who would offer a new way of living for God's people. And in order to do that, God came to us. God came to us in the form of a humble baby, conceived through the Holy Spirit, carried by a human and a virgin, no less, until he made his way into the world, taking his first breath of musty and dirty air in a stable. A baby born to human parents who welcomed him with joy and perhaps a bit of trepidation. A baby who was God incarnate. A baby who would shake up the world and cause many people to ask the question, Who is this Jesus and why is he so important? Who is he? Who is this man? But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to that stable and our story. Caesar Augustus, ruler of the Roman Empire from 27 BCE to 14 CE, issued an announcement that went out to families, saying that they should be registered with the Roman government. Caesar Augustus was revered and seen more as a god than as a ruler or leader. He had restored Roman rule in the city, and people were said to have been living in a time of peace, celebrating him as lord and savior of the world. Quirinius was currently serving as governor of Syria, and together this census would serve one major purpose, to attempt to regulate the collection of taxes. So as you can imagine, people made their way to their own towns to be registered, not wanting to defy their rulings. Amid the hustle and bustle of this duty to be registered, Joseph had his own problems. You see, Joseph was engaged to be married to a young woman named Mary. But Joseph was in quite the predicament because Mary was pregnant, but not with his child. They weren't married yet. Joseph, according to sources close to him, had intended to dump Mary, cutting off their engagement and dismissing her quietly to deal with this pregnancy on her own. But an angel came to him and asked him to not be afraid of this situation or to take Mary as his wife, because Mary had been given an immense responsibility to bear a son who would come to save the world and save people from their sins. This had been done to fulfill a prophecy given to earlier generations of Joseph's family that a virgin would bear a son be named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So Joseph agrees to marry this woman, this woman who is carrying the Savior of the world. Joseph and Mary made their way to Bethlehem because that is where Joseph's family lineage originated. It was here that Joseph was to register his unique family. But as they arrived, they soon realized that Mary was ready to deliver her child. But every room was booked because everyone had come back to register their own families. The only place they could find as Mary's time to deliver inched closer and closer was a stable, with only a manger and some hay to put this king into. But deliver this baby into some hay, Mary did. 
She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in whatever cloth she could find, laying around, and laid him gently into the feeding trough for the animals, exhausted from her delivery and wanting to rest. But rest she did not get. There were others who had heard about this baby's birth, the Messiah that was born in Bethlehem who would change everything. There were shepherds in the field who had been told by an angel of the Lord that this Savior was born. They were just trying to watch their flocks at night to make sure nothing wicked came their way. And bam, out of the blue, an angel comes and brings its angel friends to sing choruses upon choruses announcing this baby's birth. I mean, if you were them, wouldn't you want to go and see what this baby was all about? And when they arrived, they found Mary and Joseph and the child laying in the feeding trough, and they knew that what they had been told by God was true. This baby was different. They praised God for this miracle they had been witness to, and returning to their fields, continued to praise God for all they had seen and heard as it had been told to them. This story is just the beginning. This story of Jesus Christ, the story of this baby who would grow into a man who would die brutally for us, even though we don't deserve it. This is just the beginning of the story. We have a lot to cover yet, so buckle up, because we're going to take a look at the life of Jesus Christ and why his story matters, why our story as God's people matters, why you matter. We will cover the highlights of Jesus' life and ministry from birth to right before his death, so you can understand why Jesus was loved by some and hated by others, causing many to plot against him to try to kill him, which they eventually did. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Fast forward now to Jesus' adulthood and the moment of Jesus' baptism. Jesus had been traveling from Galilee to the Jordan River, where he knew that John the Baptist would be baptizing others. As Jesus approached the river, he heard John speaking to the crowd, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John looked at Jesus who was coming down to him and asked him to baptize him. Jesus, in response, asked to be baptized by John. So John does. Just then, as sources noted, the sky did something unusual. The heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit descended upon them like a dove, followed by a strong voice coming from that same direction, declaring, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So not only did the baptism of Jesus bring about a change in weather, but a foreshadowing to something big coming, something that will be revealed more fully as the story progresses. Shortly after Jesus was baptized, Jesus faced one of his first challenges. Jesus had been led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. Days passed, nights passed, and after a while Jesus realized that he had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. It was then that Jesus was approached by someone, someone unfriendly, someone who sought to put Jesus to the test in hopes of gaining some of this power that Jesus seemed to possess. As Jesus was in the wilderness, and remember he hadn't eaten anything for 40 days and nights, he was approached by Satan. Satan in this moment is tempting Jesus, tempting him to use his power to prove he has power. Satan turns to Jesus and asks him to turn stones into bread. But Jesus refuses, saying, One does not live by bread alone. So Satan tries another tactic. He takes Jesus to oversee a temple in the holy city, asking Jesus to throw himself down and worship him. And if Jesus did, then all the kingdoms of the world would be his. But Jesus again refuses, saying, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So Satan thinks about one more trick up his sleeve, taking Jesus to Jerusalem and telling Jesus, well, if you're so powerful, throw yourself down and let the angels save you. Jesus again resists and says, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In that moment, when Jesus had resisted every offer that Satan had thrown his way, Satan departed. But listeners, Satan will be back. And back with a vengeance more than ever before.
Jesus has some work to do, but he cannot do it alone, so he decides to do some recruiting. Now, one would think that Jesus would try to pick some people with great reputations or useful skills or trades to build his following. But Jesus, being who he was, does the unexpected. He was walking along the Sea of Galilee and sees two brothers, known in the village to be Simon, also called Peter, fun nickname I suppose, and Andrew. Peter and Andrew were fishing, minding their own business when Jesus approached them and said, Follow me. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. Now if that was me, and some guy was coming up to me and asking me to fish for people, people, I would look at him like he was crazy. I mean, didn't he know that you fished for fish? But no, not Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They get up and follow Jesus, leaving behind their nets, their families, their homes, and follow Jesus. Something about this guy was different, and I'm sure they could feel it. So they're walking along and they see two other brothers, James and John, in a boat with their father, Zebedee. Again, Jesus called to them to follow him. And they do. Folks, these two other brothers get up, leave their father, and follow Jesus. Immediately, something had been ignited inside of them, understanding that following Jesus gave them an incredible purpose in life to be part of something bigger than themselves. So Jesus now has his first followers, his first friends who will be at his side until, well, We'll get to that part later. We are now getting to the bulk of Jesus' ministry and the miracles, healings, and teachings that not only made Jesus who he was as God incarnate, the Son of God, sent to change the world, but also what led to his death. You see, in these teachings and miracles, Jesus was challenging the status quo and preaching about some radical ideas that went against society and religious life of the time. One of Jesus' first reported teaching moments was a sermon he gave on a mountain just outside the city. Jesus sees a large crowd and goes up on a mountain so he can be both seen and heard, and uses this as a moment to share his message. Jesus preaches about who is blessed, saying that the poor, the oppressed, those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst, those who are peacemakers, those who are persecuted, are blessed. This was such a radical idea because there were people in society that were often looked down on or left out of any kind of blessings because of their status. This was so unexpected. This radical preaching was only the beginning of moments in Jesus' life and ministry that were used against him as evidence in his murder trial. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He teaches his followers how to pray, what we know today as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus uses this prayer as a means for the people of God to connect with God and to know that God will hear their prayers. Along with prayer, Jesus also taught the greatest commandment, the greatest rule and way of life that we can follow. Jesus says to his followers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. Jesus isn't messing around with this desire for us to not only love God, but to love our neighbors, strangers, friends, family, and those in society who are often forgotten. This teaching is another mark against Jesus, with people criticizing all that he is doing, and the list only gets longer as Jesus continues his ministry. Join us every Wednesday for our Lent meal and worship service. We serve our meals from 5.30 p.m. till 6.30 p.m. and a free will offering is taken. Worship is at 7 p.m. and is led by our youth choir and men's band as we do the Holden Evening Prayer Worship Service. You can also live stream all of our worship services at the Trendy Lutheran Facebook page or watch them later from our YouTube channel. What would this episode be without some miracles? Jesus performed many miracles in his short life on earth, those roughly 30 years. And what would the story be without a wedding? Jesus' first miracle was performed at the wedding at Cana. 
Jesus' mother was there, along with Jesus and some of his disciples, and the folks at the wedding had a serious problem. They had run out of wine. Heaven forbid they run out of wine at a celebration. Mary even comes over to Jesus and points out the obvious. They have no wine. So Jesus, as a good wedding guest and the Son of God, tells the servants who were at the wedding to fill six stone jugs with water. Jesus then tells them to pour some out and take it to the chief steward. And wouldn't you know, when those jugs were poured out, each one was filled with wine and provided the wedding guests with a night of celebration. After the wedding, Jesus continued to show who he was through the miracles he performed. Jesus was causing quite a stir in the cities and communities he went to, and because of that, it was important for him to find time to be alone and pray, time to reflect on what he had done and what was to come. Jesus had gone to a deserted place to do just that, but when the crowds of people heard that, they went in search of him and followed him on foot from town to town. As you can imagine, he didn't get much alone time. When Jesus finally came ashore, he saw the great crowd before him. After a full day of healing the sick and showing compassion to those in need, Jesus' disciples came to him with a big concern. They were running out of food. They wanted the crowds to be sent away so that they could go into the villages and buy their own food. Jesus turned to them and said, They do not have to go away. You give them something to eat. The disciples were surprised at Jesus' reaction, exclaiming that they only had five loaves of bread and two fish. How on earth was that amount of food supposed to feed the gigantic crowd that was numbering in the thousands? Jesus had a simple response. Bring them to me. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them back to the disciples. As the disciples began to hand out the food to the enormous crowd, they realized something. They somehow had enough. Whatever Jesus had said and done with the bread, it had given them enough food to feed 5,000 people. Everyone had enough to eat. If we look at Jesus' travels and his journey from city to city, we can see that he often followed bodies of water or used them to travel with his growing group of disciples. Days had passed since the feeding of the 5,000 people and Jesus had decided that he wanted to go across to the other side of this body of water. So his disciples, following his example, got into the boat with him and left another crowd behind on the shore. When they were traveling across the water, a massive storm arose. The kind of storm that rattles your bones and shakes you to your core. The waves crashed against them, water splashed into their boat, soaking them, chilling them. For many of them, they thought this was the end. And while they feared for their lives, Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. Asleep! First, how could anyone sleep when all this was going on? And second, didn't he care about them about to drown in the sea? So they wake him up, shaking him to consciousness and saying, Don't you care that we are about to die? Jesus woke and said, Peace, be still. It was said that at that exact moment that his words were uttered, the wind stopped and there was this eerie calm that surrounded them. It was a moment where the disciples who witnessed asked each other, Who is this guy? The wind even obeys him. While they were still not fully aware of who Jesus was, this experience with the storm showed them that Jesus had a power they couldn't understand, but meant more than they knew. It's important to note that not everyone was happy with Jesus' miracles, especially when those miracles were performed on days when it was customary to rest. In fact, one recorded miracle in Jerusalem became a moment when Jesus not only ruffled some feathers of local authorities, but also triggered more urgent discussion of how to stop this man who was going against every custom and practice that was considered appropriate in that time. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem and visited an area of the city where locals who were ill gathered. The blind, the paralyzed, those in need of healing or respite. Jesus, as one who had been gaining a reputation for his miracles and healings, visited a man in this area who had been ill for 38 years. Jesus saw this man lying there and knew that he had been there for a long time. 
Jesus asks this man if he wants to be made well. Now, I'm sure this man had a sense of both relief and skepticism. Of course he wanted to be well, but how could this man help? In this area was a pool that was commonly known as a place where one could be healed if placed in the pool. So this man turns to Jesus and plainly says, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. Everyone else keeps going ahead of me. Instead of helping this man into the pool, Jesus turns to him and tells him to get up and walk. And friends, it worked. This man was healed at once, got up, took his mat, and began to walk. While most people would be amazed at this miracle that had occurred, some of the local authorities and community members saw this and were outraged. They were outraged because Jesus was healing on the Sabbath, what was supposed to be a day of rest. The Jews began to further persecute Jesus, but Jesus answers their persecution by telling them that his father is still working on the Sabbath, and therefore, so am I. They were outraged at this response. How dare he call God his own father? How dare he equate himself to God? How dare he break the Sabbath? This moment of healing for this man who had been ill for many years became a trigger for those in society who could not see past rules and customs into the work that Jesus was doing. It became a moment that led to more conspiring against Jesus, conspiring that would lead to his death. Jesus was not only a healer and performer of miracles, but he was a teacher. Jesus was the kind of teacher who challenged those around him to be better and consider a different way of living and being in the world where you not only looked out for yourself, but for those around you, those he called your neighbors. For Jesus, this was absolutely key to his ministry. You see, Jesus was living in a time that was fraught with division among social classes, division among religions, Division among races, division that tore through society like a storm. Part of Jesus' ministry was teaching about other ways of viewing the world, especially knowing that God was with them in that world through the work of Jesus. Jesus spoke in parables, short stories with a lesson. For Jesus, it was important to use tangible examples in his parables that were applicable to daily life. One of Jesus' most famous parables was the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was having a conversation with a lawyer. Well, a debate is probably more like it. The lawyer was wanting to test Jesus' knowledge and his intentions. So he asked Jesus, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with a question, as he so often did, by saying, What do you read there in the law? The lawyer replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you are correct. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer wasn't satisfied with that answer. So he pushed Jesus more saying, who is my neighbor? Jesus began to tell a story. A man was going down from Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him to die. Now by chance, a priest was walking down that road, but when he saw this man, he passed by him on the other side of the road. Then another religious leader came walking down that same road, a Levite, but he didn't stop either. He turned the other way. Soon enough, a Samaritan, meaning a person from Samaria, came down that road also. But the Samaritan stopped, helped the man up, and took him to an inn to take care of him. The Samaritan paid for this man's stay and promised to come back and pay any more that the innkeeper spent on caring for this man. Jesus finished this parable and turned to the lawyer. Which of these three was a neighbor to the man who was injured by robbers? The lawyer responded, the Samaritan. Jesus said, go and do likewise. What was so important, you might ask, about this parable in particular? The key to this story is in the examples of people that Jesus used. Samaritans were outcasts in Jewish society. They were looked down upon and the very last people that anyone expected to help another, especially a Jew. By using this example, Jesus was again challenging society's norms and pushing those around him to consider what it would have been like to live in a world where people looked out for one another 
with compassion and love, as God does for all of God's people. This is what Jesus was proclaiming. And again, as Jesus continued to preach about the forgotten, the oppressed, the left out and left behind, those around him wanted him punished for his radical ideas about salvation and living as people of God. Rather than back down from the threats and conspiracies, Jesus continued to teach. His teaching grew more direct and purpose-filled and became a foreshadowing to what was to come. Jesus began to teach about who he was as the Son of Man, the Son of Man who would experience great suffering, rejection, and death at the hands of chief priests, elders, and scribes. But his death would not be the end of the story. Jesus would rise again after three days. Jesus told his disciples time and time again, the Son of Man will be betrayed by those around us. The message would take a while to sink in. They couldn't fully grasp his meaning. And they were afraid. They were afraid to ask any more questions. They were afraid that what Jesus was saying would not only happen to him, but to them as well. This is where we end our story for now, at this pivotal moment which leads to the end. The end of Jesus' life, his arrest, public betrayal, and brutal execution. Next week, on the Word Examined podcast, we will begin our journey with Jesus toward the end. Next Wednesday, we will begin with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the last moment in his life where he was celebrated and praised for his ministry and message, the last moment in his life before betrayal and death knock at his door. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. This episode is sponsored by Bethlehem Inn and Suites. On your way to Jerusalem to worship the Passover and need a place to stay? Come into your ancestral family's home for the most recent registration? Stop in to Bethlehem Inn and Suites. Comfortable, clean rooms. Free breakfast every morning. We also have a very comfortable stable you can stay in when there is no room in the inn. Bethlehem Inn and Suites, your home away from home. Make your reservation today. Thank you for listening. This podcast was written, recorded, and edited by Katie Wagner. The Word Examined Podcast. Available on Anchor Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Spotify.